computer. Amazing. Okay. So first of all, I want to welcome everyone to the month of Cheshvan. Um, the the uh, new moon, woman circle, Chodesh Tov. Everyone should have a wonderful, beautiful, blessed month. Here in um, Israel, it's actually, it is a Rosh. Oh, no, it's already Rosh Chodesh by you also. What am I saying? You already, you're, already, uh, you're already in the new month as well. So now we're in the month of Cheshvan, which is, we come off of a real high. It's the month of Tishrei. is the month of all the high holidays. And then we enter into the month of Cheshvan which is really like the beginning of the winter season, the high holidays are over, and we're kind of getting back to the grind of life. You know, as we're down into the real life, getting into the grind of life. And it's actually called, Cheshvan actually has a name, it's called Mar Cheshvan, which means bitter Cheshvan, the month of bitterness. Now, why is that? So on one hand, it's because it's the only month of the year that doesn't have a holiday in it right? It's one month of the year, nothing. There's not a single holiday in it. But we're going to see, as we're going to see soon, there is tons of potential, amazing potential hidden in this month. And it really shifted my perspective from Mar Cheshvan to like a month of tr accessing tremendous light and tremendous potential. And in order to understand that, we have to go through looking at it from many different levels. But when we start looking, and before we get into the deep, the depth and really the Kabbalistic level, it's important to first look at it from a historical level. Like what happened in history that this month is called Bitter Cheshvan? What happened in history? So this goes back to the story of, um, there was a revolt against the kingdom of David. And it was during the kingdom of the king called Rechavam, who was one of the sons of King Solomon. And during that, his reign, there was a wise man and his name was, Rech was Yeravam. And at first he was a very, very righteous individual. But what happened at the end was he changed his path and he revolted against King Rechavam. And what he did was he pulled the 10 tribes with him. So you, I'm sure many of you have heard about the story of the splitting of the 10 tribes. And that was the beginning of the split of the 10 tribes of Judah and Israel. That was the beginning of the split. And what happened was the kingdom of Judah moved over to Samaria and they made their a makeshift temple. And that makeshift temple actually became the, the home to idolatry. And therefore, we see that this was a month of discord in its essence, because that during this time was when this split happened, and when the temple was moved to this to um, to Samaria, and that started the time of idolatry. And it was to the extent that even King Yerevam, Yerevam, what he did was he actually moved all of the months from the month of Tishrei to the month of Cheshvan which was meaning that he lost the whole spiritual essence of the holidays, thinking that he could take them and move them to a different month. He was like totally off guard, totally off beat. And um, the prophets say that God was very upset about this rebellion and about the Jewish people. And, and it looked as if the Jewish people were literally rebelling against God. So we see from the beginning that this month was a month of a lot of intensity. And this month laid the framework for the destruction and rebelling against God. And therefore, this month is called Mar Cheshvan, that it's historically considered a very a bitter month, okay? But yet, now, we're going to see that even though this month is called Mar Cheshvan, it actually says that the third temple is going to be rebuilt during this month. And this was like huge. When I learned this, this is a huge shift in the whole energy of the entire month. So as we're gonna see that the first three months of the year, we have the month of Tishrei, which was last month, the month of Cheshvan that we're in right now, and next month, the month of Kislev, are all connected to the temples, okay? So it says that last month, in the month of Tishrei, that was connected to the tribe of Ephraim, and it says that the first temple was inaugurated in the month of Tishrei. There was an inauguration of the temple after it was built, and that happened in the month of Tishrei. Then in the month of Cheshvan, the month that we're in, is connected to the tribe of Menashe. 
the tribe of um, of the twelve tribes. It's connected to the tribe of Menashe, and it says that the first temple was completed during this month, and the third temple is going to be consecrated during this month, during the month of Cheshvan. Now, the next month, the month of Kislev, is connected to the tribe of Benjamin. And it says about that month that the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which was the temporary dwelling place before the time of the Beit HaMikdash, before the time of the temple, that was completed in the month of Kislev. And the second temple was actually consecrated in the month of um, Kislev as well. So what do we see from these three months? What do we, these three months have in common? All these three months of Tishrei is connected to the tribe of Ephraim. Cheshvan is connected to the tribe of Menashe, and Kislev is connected to the tribe of Benjamin. What is common of those all these three months and all the three tribes that are associated with the months is that they're all descendants of Rachel, of our matriarch, Rachel. Rachel was the mother of Benjamin, and she was the grandmother of Menashe and Ephraim, who were the sons of Joseph, which was her, which was her, um, her son. So that's what we see. We see that Rachel is the theme that is running through all these three months of Tishrei, Cheshvan, and Kislev. Now, what is who is Rachel? Rachel, our matriarch Rachel, she is called a Karid Habayit. She is the main wife of Jacob. Okay, Jacob had two wives. He had Rachel and he had Leah. Leah was his other wife, right? But Rachel, it says he was her main wife. Now, what does that mean that it was her, his main wife and that he loved Rachel more than Leah? Like, we have to really understand this. What does that mean on a deeper level? So Jacob, why did he love Rachel? Because spiritually, they both had the same spiritual service. They were both connected to the same spiritual service. Okay. It says that Jacob, Jacob's name is Yud Akev. Yud is the highest name, which is the point of Chachma, God's highest wisdom, the highest point of godliness. And Akev means a heel. So Jacob, what was his spiritual service that he was able to draw down godliness from Yud, from the highest spiritual service? worlds, all the way down to the heel, to the lowest spiritual worlds. He was, he took godly consciousness from the highest point, and he brought it all the way down into what's called malchut, into the physical, into the here and now. That was, that was Jacob's spiritual avoda, his spiritual mission in this world, right? And of his two wives, who was most similar to him in that mission? It was actually Rachel. Okay, it says that Leah, Leah was more hidden. It says she was praying all day. She was praying that she shouldn't be um, taken as a wife to Esav and that she stayed inside. And it says her eyes were wet because she was crying. Now, what does that mean? It means that Rachel, in essence, she was a very high spiritual soul. It actually says that spiritually, she was on a higher level than, than Rachel. But the difference between Rachel and Leah was that Leah was not able to be drawn down into the world. She was on such a high spiritual level, but she wasn't able to connect that service and draw it down into the physical world like Rachel was. And therefore... Jacob, who again, he was the idea of drawing down Yud Akev, of drawing down godliness from the highest spiritual realms down into the lower realms, into Malchut, he felt this connection to Rachel. It says that Rachel, it says that she was beautiful inside and she was beautiful outside. She was Yifat Toar and Yifat Mara. Now, what does that mean that she was beautiful inside and beautiful outside is that she was able to channel down this high level of spirituality all the way down into Malchut. And that's why Jacob loved her the most. And that's why she is called the Akeret Habayid, the main um, Ikar. Ikar literally means the main of his bayid, of his home. He was his, her, his main wife, Rachel. Now, very interestingly, when we look at the word akeret habayit, which is the ikar habayit, the main part of his home, what do we see in the letters of ikar, of akeret? We see akrav, which is a scorpion. 
okay? And the sign of the month of Cheshvan is a scorpion. Now we're gonna get into that more later, but um, what, and what do we see again? We said that this month is connected to the third temple, to the third temple being rebuilt. And what is God's main home? What is, is his ikara by it? What is his main home down in this world is the temple. That is how God channels down his light into the world is through the temple. And therefore we see that Rachel, whose service was drawing down this, this light of godliness down into the world, she had this lineup of these temples, right? She was connected to the month of Tishrei, which was Benjamin, to the month of, of Cheshvan, which is Menashe, and to the month of Kislev, which is Ephraim. And they were all connected to the idea of the building of the temple and the inauguration of the temples, because again, that's the idea of the I carried a by it, the main home, not only of Jacob, but the main home of God, which is the temple, which we're waiting to be rebuilt. And, um, and it's an amazing thing to think that this is the month where, again, we could see there's bitterness, but there is so much potential in it. And this month is really about taking all of the inspiration that we had in the month of Tishrei and drawing it down. You know, it's very easy during the month of Tishrei, the month of the holidays, that we're all inspired. But what is it about? All right? Again, it's not about just being inspired and being in the realm of holiness, right? And just like, keeping in the realm of holiness, but it's really about God's like, no, 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 no. The main thing is bringing it down, down to this world. And not only, and again, during this month, the temple is going to be rebuilt, but during this month, we have tremendous um energy and tremendous um a gift of really being able to build our own inner temples and when we do that work of building our own inner temples then we help usher in the temple being rebuilt and it should really happen very very speedily now <laughs> the world needs it more than ever now 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 <laughs> um Okay, now we're going to get into each month, again, according to the Sefer Yitzira, which is the book of formation, which was actually written by Abraham, says that each month is connected to a different sense. And this month is connected to the sense of smell. Now, again, this is now during this time of COVID, I think we all appreciate smell in such a different way. I was just talking to my sister who is getting over COVID. She's like, Miriam, you don't even know what it's like not to be able to smell. She's like, I never realized how much I rely on my smell when I'm cooking. Like, it's like all my food is being burnt. <laughs> I didn't realize, like, okay, I usually don't set a timer. I just wait to smell the food and see what's happening. You know, it's like, we don't realize the appreciation of the sense of smell, you know, and it's really coming out right now during this month, which is connected to the sense of smell. Now, what is the idea of the sense of smell? Smell is the only sense that wasn't blemished during the sin of the tree of knowledge. During the sin, when we, when we read last in last week's Torah portion in, in um, Genesis, in Bereshit, about the sin of Etada, the sin of the tree of knowledge, it says that Eve, that Chava, she felt. And it said she heard and she tasted from the tree, but it doesn't say that she smelled. So smell is a, therefore the most spiritual sense that we have. And that's why smell is really intertwined with the temple. Okay, it says what is the main service, the main sacrifice of the temple, um, and it's actually the sacrifice that the, the high priest brought inside the um, Kodesh HaKadosh and the Holy of Holies during the um, service of the Yom Kippur service, one of the sacrifices that he brought, which was the Ketoret, which is the incense, which is smell and the smoke of this incense. And the smell in that service of the katori, the, the service of the incense, it's channeled down godliness, again, channeling down godliness into the world via the temple. So the highest sense that we really have, the purest of all of our senses is the sense of smell. It's associated with purity, right? When we meet someone, you know, and we, we kind of like, you could get a tense, a sense of someone, like you have a certain intuition. It's almost like a smell, you know, like you meet someone, you're like, 
this person has a good smell. You have this intuition. This person is like a holy person. Like if you ever see a picture, like a tzaddik, right? A very righteous individual or just someone special. You walk in, you can, see, you can almost say like, there's a sense something smells really good about this person, right? And that's because smell is really associated also with intuition, with bina, which is also a, a sense of women, specifically of women, that we have a sense of a different level, a higher level of intuition, a bina yatira which is a sense of just like, just getting it, just knowing, it's a sense of smell. And even we see like with babies, you know, like whenever I have my newborn babies, I'm like, oh my God, they smell so good, right? And it's not the Johnson and Johnson sets, you know, soap that we're smelling, right? But you go to a nursery and it's just like, ah, oh, you could just like take it in the smell of a baby. What are we smelling? We're smelling purity right? There's, babies are such pure souls that just came out of the womb, this newborn baby, right? They just were basking in the womb, learning Torah from the angels. And so there's a smell of a newborn baby. That's purity that we're smelling. And that brings me, there's a story, a beautiful story in the Zohar, that there was a young boy, he was called the Yanuka. He was a son of one of the great sages. I can't remember the name. Um, it's slipping me right now. But it said that um, there was a young, this, this young sage, this young boy called the Yanuka, the great sages of that time would come and they would learn from him. He was such a high, elevated, lofty soul that the Zohar says that they used to come and learn from this boy called the Yanuka. And it says when the great students of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when they came into his house, into the Yanuka's house, it says that he smelled on them that they didn't say the Shema prayer. And they were stunned. They're like, you're telling me we didn't say this sh Shema prayer? We didn't say this prayer? And he says, yeah, I smell on you that you didn't say the Shema prayer. Now it happens to be that they were exempt from saying the Shema prayer because they because they were actually in the middle of learning Torah. But anyway, what does it say? It says that he, he smelled it. He was such a high, pure soul, this Yanuka that his sense of smell was so refined. And that's again, again, this correlation of this month with the rebuilding of the third temple, with this sacrifice, the incense, the ketorah sacrifice, which is again, this elevation of uh, this bringing down of godliness and of purity down into this physical world, which is the idea of the temple. And we should all see that sacrifice, the ketorah happening very, very, very soon. Okay, now, again, each month has a different letter associated with it. And this month is associated with the letter Nun. Okay, the letter in the Hebrew alphabet called Nun. Now, Nun in Hebrew, um, there is the beginning letter and the end letter. So the, the beginning letter of Nun, it draws down, right? It goes down and then, then it goes vertical. I mean, excuse me, horizontal. And a final nun, the end letter nun, it just draws down. It's a letter that just goes down, okay? Now nun, it actually says about it that it's one of the most controversial letters in the entire Hebrew alphabet, okay? Why? Because nun means, it says nofel, and nofel in Hebrew means to fall. And we see that in the very shape of the nun, right? The shape of the nun, the letter nun, it draws down, it falls down. That's the idea of the nun. Now, each letter, again, has a different gematria, a different, um, a different numerical value. And the numerical value for the letter nun is 50, okay? Now, 50, as we're gonna see, represents an abyss, okay? Now, it says in Egypt, when we were in Egypt, we were at the 49th level of impurity, right? And what happened? If we would have entered into the 50th gate of impurity, we would not have been able to come out. We would have been in this place of this deep abyss, this deep darkness, this deep abyss, and we would not have been able to come out. So that's, again, this idea of 50 being connected to the abyss. Okay, from, from the negative perspective. Now we're going to see soon again, nothing ever ends in this. We can never say it's just negative. So we're going to get into soon the positive perspective of it. But from that perspective, we see that even in the um, prayer, the Ashray prayer, which is one of the prayers that we say every day during, during davening, during morning prayers. And it's Psalm 125 in Tehillim in Psalms of King David. 
he actually, if you notice, he leaves out the letter nun. Each, each one of the ashray prayer is a different one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But he actually, King David actually leaves out the letter nun, specifically leaves out this letter nun. Why? Because again, nun means to fall. And it connotes the Jewish people falling into this level of the 50th, into this level of the abyss, into the darkness. And King David didn't want any association with that in this prayer, in this Tehillim, in this Psalm. So we actually let, left out the letter Nun. But again, as we said, nothing can, we can just interpret it from a place of darkness. We have to now interpret it. What does it mean in a positive framework, right? And that is that 50 also represents, it says there's 50 gates of Bina, 50 gates of intuition, okay? Um, which is, again, what we were saying, intuition is the idea of smell, right? There's 50 gates of Bina of intuition. And it says, what does it say? That when the Jews actually came out of Egypt, what did they do, right? We entered, when we were in Egypt, we entered the 49th level of impurity and God took us out, right? By the 50th, before we entered into the 50th. But when we were coming out of Egypt, what do we do? We counted 49 days. And on the 50th day, what do we do? We receive the Torah. That was Shavuot, the day that we actually received the Torah. So what do we receive? When we receive the Torah, what do we receive? We receive spiritual abyss, right? That we entered into this place of the abyss, but the spiritual abyss, which is the infinite gift of Torah, infinite life and wisdom that comes down into the world. So again, we see in this month, there's so much potential. It represents this idea of the nun, represents two different opposites. Either it can bring us down into the darkness or it can raise us up to the highest heights, right? So this month, again, we see there is so much potential. It's like after Tishrei, after the high holidays, and now it's like the work really is on us to make this choice, really. That this month, right, it's a month of discord that can separate us, like during the story of King David, right? Or it can be the fixing of the month of Cheshvan, which is that Nun, which can raise us up really to the highest heights. And it says that when Mashiach, that nun also means in Aramaic, nun means nuna, which is a fish. And what does it say? It says when Mashiach comes, it says in the prophet Ezekiel that we are going to be like fish swimming in the sea. We're going to be basking and swimming in the sea of Torah and the sea of godliness, right? That we are going to be literally like fish just swimming in that sea of godliness. And that's the idea, again, of this nun of the fish of the spiritual abyss, of basking in the light of the redemption, which is really, we can access that, again, during this month, especially, which, which is the month of Cheshvan, when um, the third temple is going to be rebuilt. Okay, now I want to go back. What we mentioned before, we said that the sign of the month is a Scorpio. Okay, we said before that Rachel, she was called Akarad Habayit, Right, the main, um, the main uh, mainstay of the home, and akaret. What we say is the same letters as the word akrav, which is a scorpion, which is the sign of this month. Now, a Scorpio actually lives very deep inside the Earth. It's an Earth sign. If anyone who ever studied astrology at all knows that there's certain signs that are Earth signs, certain ones that are air signs. So, like Virgo, last month is actually also I think an Earth sign. And Scorpio, this month is an earth sign. It's a very earth sign. And that represents being in the practical and bringing things down, right? Down to earth. I remember actually when we, just bringing back memories, when we moved to our house, we, it was like, a we were the first people in it. So they were literally, they had lifted up the dirt, you know, they had built the house. And when we moved in, there were so many scorpions in this house. Like it was beyond. So I never understood that a scorpion really lives deep in the earth until we moved here and I saw what they mean. It was like we just couldn't get rid of them and thank, thank God they're gone. But um, again, it's the idea that the scorpion lives very deep in the earth. And But what is that again? That's the idea of this month, which is very practical. Bringing things down, what we said, the highest lights, 
the highest levels of godly consciousness, but bringing it down in a practical way, being very goal oriented, being down to earth, being detail oriented, you know, again, coming from these high holidays, it's like, it's very easy either to get lost in the inspiration, but it's like, really the whole point is like, what do we do with that inspiration, right? And this month is like, an earth sign, an earth month, the whole energy of the month is now like being practical, making practical goals and bringing it down in a very practical way. And we really see that very much within the third temple. It says that the third temple is actually going to be one of the most, the most beautiful of all the temples. There's a lot of intricate details. And it's going to be the most beautiful of all the of all of the three temples because again it's that idea of bringing down godliness into the into the physical and that the physical and the spiritual are really one are one in its essence and um and that's why uh, the work of this month where the temple is going to be re rebuilt we see it's a very feminine month because the whole essence of femininity is Malchut, right? Malchut is the, um, of the spherot. It's the feminine of the spherot, the feminine one of the spherot. And what is Malchut? Malchut is the idea of bringing down into the vessel of the very physical world, all of the godly night lights. It's where the light meets the vessel. So again, we see that this month is actually a very feminine month that we as women have extra, extra energy within our soul of really doing that work of realizing Hashem in the details, right? It's again, like we're back in the grime of the, of the, of the year. And there's again, like the laundry and going back to work. And, uh, you know, especially people are home now in lockdown with your kids being home. And it's like realizing that the spiritual and the physical really are one. And it's really all about bringing it down into the very practical. And that is, the physical is an expression of Hashem. The idea of like, ain't od milvado, that everything is Hashem. And this physical is just this channeling down of this godly light. That's the energy of this month. That's in essence the energy of this month. Okay. And that's why, again, as we saw, the third temple was the most beautiful, right? It, it had the most intricate details because again, it's about the details. Hashem wants to be found within the details of our life. Hashem wants a very intimate relationship with us. And intimacy is about details, right? It's about really having that deep, deep relationship and bringing it down. Now we're gonna get into the body part, okay? Again, every month is associated with a different body part. The body part of this month is the veins. Now, what is the idea of the veins? The veins, they connect the entire intricacies of our body. They bring oxygen to our entire body. And what is that idea of the vein is really unifying. It's a unifying, the veins really un unite our whole body, it unites all our organs and our blood, everything is united through the veins. And unifying opposites, that's the energy of this month because the third temple is gonna be the unifying home of God, right? Where all people, Jews, non-Jews, we're gonna unite with one goal, right? There's gonna be one united goal in mind for the entire world, which is revealing godliness down into the world. And that's the idea of, um, of the veins being connected to um, the month. Now, the, interestingly enough, also, we said that the tribe of the month is the tribe of Menashe. Now, Menashe, he is actually a tribe that united Israel, okay? It says, when Israel was being divided, when the land of Israel was actually being divided, it says half of Menashe lived in the land of the seven nations in Israel proper, and the other half of Menashe actually lived in the Transjordan, which is out of Israel proper with Reuven and, um, and God. So Moses placed them specifically there outside of the land of Israel proper because he wanted that the Jewish people should be united from both sides. It shouldn't just be that Israel, Israel should be 
from Israel proper, but he wanted that the Jewish people should have a physical presence outside of the land of Israel in order to unite them, to unite the Jewish people and the world together and all the people together with the land of Israel. And that happened specifically through Menashe, right? And, um, and that's the, the tribe of the month. And Menashe, what do we see about Menashe? Menashe is the same letters as Neshama. What is Neshama? Neshama means a soul. And again, we said that the soul, Menashe, the soul is the idea of smell, of purity, of holiness, right? Um, and again, where is the soul expressed down in this world? Where, where are we going to be able to express ourselves with the greatest in the, with the greatest realm of revealing godliness in this world, that's the third temple. And that's, again, going to be um, rebuilt during this month. So again, like, I don't know, when I started learning, it like really blew me away this month, because again, there's so, this month, what I really would say is like, we have a choice this month. Again, we have this choice that we came from, again, the high holidays, and there's so much inspiration, but now we have a choice of really taking that inspiration like, like Jacob, like Rachel, and bringing it down. And um, that is the idea of really re 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 revealing Mashiach in our personal lives, right? When we do this inner work of, um, of bringing down godliness into our life and, real, and really bringing out our essence and our true essence, which is our godly essence, then not only do we bring our own personal redemption, but we really help usher in the global redemption and we've never needed it more than now. I mean, it's like, we know it's happening. This is like this, the world is like more than ever. I feel like, I mean, the world is just like, we're, we're, we're really at the footsteps, you know, of Mashiach. And we should all really go from strength to strength and accomplishing this. And we really should have this great success spiritually and in um, bringing it down practically this month. And, um, and in that marriage, the third temple should really be rebuilt. We should see it now. And I think it's really a great month to um, to really make some sort of like, um, it's called a hachlata, like some sort of goal, sometimes take upon ourselves something that we really have been wanting to do for a long time. And we haven't done it, right? It's a really great time right now to think like, what could I do to really bring down? Like, you know, after the high hotties, we're all inspired. It's like, you know, before like the New Year's, we have all these New Year's resolutions and New Year's ideas, you know? I know for myself personally, there's so many, I have a whole long list, right? But it's like, if we just take one, one thing, and we say to ourselves now, this is the month of really being practical, earth side, this is an earth month of really bringing it down and just take one goal. And it doesn't have to be huge, you know, like sometimes we think of a goal as something that has to change the world. Not at all. You know what I'm saying? Something very practical that we could take for ourselves to, um, to really bring it down and to, um, and when we do that, really, I feel like we do that work, that inner work of revealing our own inner temple. And we really, really all help usher in the, um, the global redemption. And we should really see it very, very, very soon. So first of all, I didn't check the chat. I realized in a while, let's see if anyone had any questions. I said a lot here. Oh, I can't get on the chat from Rita. We'll be celebrating your birthday on Thursday. Yay. Who's that? Mazel tov. Shireen. Mazel tov to you. A Scorpio. Happy birthday to your fellow Scorpios. <laughs> Absolutely. Mazel tov. It should be an amazing year. An amazing month for everyone. Oh, please mute everyone. Too much background noise. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not do that. I hope everyone heard. I'm sorry. Usually I remember to do that. And it's very associated with memory as well. That's smell and memory. Who's that? Carolyn. Yeah, Karen, can you, can you explain that a little bit more? Do you want to unmute yourself? I would love to hear. Um, um, it's actually something that's been studied both on from a spiritual perspective as well as a um, mental health perspective that um, scent is tied to a lot of memories and um, like people will smell something and they remember a certain person or right. they remember a certain experience and that it's something that can actually help with your recall of things 
So if you're, they say, if you're studying, you should, you know, light a candle or something that smells so you can remember it better. But also it helps with the healing process because you can recall some of those things that you may have forgotten based on smell and then be able to kind of process that and to work through it because of it. It's so, wow, that's so true. It's such a, it's so true. It's funny you're saying that because I was just talking to my kids. Had to be, I don't eat gluten, right? But um, I love the smell of Israeli cornflakes. I don't know, something about the smell, and I don't eat them. So I have no idea what they taste like. I really don't eat them. But I was thinking back, why do I like the smell of it? Because I was in Israel for the year when I was like 20, you know, 19 years old. And every day I ate cornflakes, and it was probably one of the best years of my life. <laughs> And there's something about, it's so true, the smell like transports me back to that time in my life. It's such an interesting, it's such a true thing that you're saying. And I think it's it's kind of interesting, at least in our house, I think every, every member of my family has commented that they don't feel like Shabbat is coming and happening until they start smelling the challah oh, being baked. And I've had other people come in just to visit for Shabbat or whatever that aren't even Jewish and they will take, they'll stop right at the door and take a big smell of it. And they're like, why do I feel relaxed all of a sudden? It's so true. And it's just, and I, I feel like that, that specific smell is tied so much to the experience of Shabbat that sure. it's really difficult to like get, you know, challah from somewhere else and not actually make it because so you don't get that smell and then it doesn't it's not the same it's not the same experience it's so true it's so true what you're saying yeah there's something about that smell you know of like mm -hmm. it's so true and again because it's really it's like a very um what we're saying it's a very spiritual thing you know it's it really connects us very deep to our soul i knew i actually heard a story about someone who was having a very difficult time with one of her children that they didn't want to keep shabbat and um, she was saying that what she did was she was very careful that she would bake challah every week, just so that her child should smell the challah in her home. And she said that years later, her kid actually, her child actually said to her, you know, like that, like they were, com she commented about the smell of the challah. And eventually this child actually came back. And she was saying, she's like, I'm t I really feel that there was something like the love that I put into the challah, but just that smell of it really connected this child back to their soul. So it's so, so true what you're saying. It's so true. Besides that, the mitzvah of challah being a very beautiful mitzvah, and it's one of the mitzvahs of women, it definitely does. Like, there's nothing like that. That smell of challah on Friday afternoon, you're so right. It's so true. And the, the offering of the incense, you know, they said, it says they can't put any honey in it because the smell would have been so amazing that our souls would have left so we even have the offering of incense and um i know uh pegging back piggybacking on what um i don't know her name beforehand but they saw they say to plant rosemary and sage um when you're studying and i guess a lot of the um a lot of the sages but not sages as in the plant but teachers would have that planted so that they could take a piece of it and smell it so mm. that was kind of cool so yeah I agree the smell even getting off the plane in Hawaii I can smell all the flowers so I think every state like California has a smell of almost like pine if you can get past the smog but mm -hmm. every state has a different scent to it that um, I don't I don't know. It remind me of my childhood because I was always flying back from here to Hawaii and, and everything. So yeah, yeah. I've actually Great I started class. getting into Thank essential so oils for healing, and I've been using them actually mm -hmm. and just smelling them, and I've really felt like wow, like a really big like it's helped me a lot with different things I'm with different areas with my children and stuff like just putting on like a diffuser in the room because again it's connecting us to to that sense of smell yeah. and it's like it really is something very very deep very holy yeah. um oh so actually someone said they thought that it was a, a um a water sign I don't know I looked it up I thought it was a a um an earth sign but honestly I am not a expert I cannot definitely cannot proclaim myself to be an expert in horoscope Study, I'm definitely much more in it from the Torah perspective, but um, that's just what I thought. I think it's 
So yeah. an um, earth sign because my son is very, well, he's a Libra and his birthday is tomorrow. I don't know. Maybe it changes, but yeah, he's very uh, even. Like he just wants to make everybody happy. He's very balanced and he doesn't, he's always in the middle of everything, which I kind of laugh because that's what the Libra sign is where I'm a fire sign. And so is my daughter. And so is my husband. And it's just like, whoo, can get kind of hot in here sometimes. <laughs> I, I always thought that it was a water sign. Um, you know, but the water signs are generally more emotional. Um, that's what I had always learned. I know Libra is an air sign. That but... Libra, Libra is an air sign? Yes. And what about, um, Scorpio? Scorpio, I've always learned Scorpio, Pisces, and Cancer are all water. Oh, earth what are signs? signs? Oh, interesting. The earth, okay, the earth signs, the earth signs are, are, are Virgo, Capricorn, and what's the other one? I can't think Taurus. of. Taurus. Taurus. There you go. Taurus. Yeah. Girl, okay. So, man, I'm, I, I'm telling you, it's not my thing, but I definitely know that um, from a Torah perspective, it's definitely yeah. about drawing it down into the earth. That I, that I know for sure. But I, I did actually, look, I don't know, maybe somewhere I saw that, but I definitely. Well, no, definitely, it, ma it, it makes sense because when I, after you said that, I was thinking, yeah, scorpions in the desert. So, but I had always learned from that astrological perspective, but then again, that's not Torah, so. Right, yeah. from a Torah perspective, I from a Scorpio room. month is a very earthy month. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I have it's a event even now from a rabbi. I have what? this race here. Each each month I have written down from a rabbi, but I don't remember I don't remember exactly what's the second. Each month has two elements, one more uh, a stronger There's one. An outer element one. and an inner inner element. So and an outer one. Uh, so so Cheshban is water and the second is air. Like Tishrei is, is air, Cheshban is water, Kislev is fire, and Tevet is earth, and then it goes again air. So Shvat is air, Adar is water. The sun is fire, the air is earth, the sun is air. It goes like that. And I know I, I am Av, and Av is two fires, and Adar is two two waters. Tammuz is water, air. Okay, interesting. I don't know. But it makes sense. If it's a water element and it's being drawn into the earth, well, how does the earth, the earth absorb the water? So that makes sense. That's, right. sense, that's it definitely is true. Drawing it downward. That is true. I don't, yeah. I don't know, but I definitely know that it's about bringing it down, um, and uh, and into it. someone's sun. Sun is chashvan is water. The there's actually um, like the element associated with it. The season has an element associated with it, and then the order of the sign in the season has an element associated with it. So there are actually three. So so the the season of Tishrei, Cheshvan, and Kislev is air, like the first three months. Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan are water. Then the next three months, the, the, um, the season is fire. The next three months, the season is air. And the last three months, the season is earth. And then each one has just a natural element associated with it. And Scorpio is water, like water, Pisces, Cancer, and Scorpio. And then there are three earth elements. And then your, your order in the season has an element associated with it. But it's interesting because we also said it's associated with like a nun, which was the idea of a fish. It's so I guess water. that's the idea of like of um of digging deep down like below the surface level, you know. I guess which is also water. right. It's the the, water the fish the fish is a water sign, so that that makes sense with the nun and the fish. That that's yeah, that's mm -hmm. water. Interesting, very interesting. Let me this one. Doctor Tom O'Brien is a leading doctor in gluten free living and teaches doctors around the world. He has a sniff test to help folks determine the risk of dementia. Very interesting. Wow. That is interesting. And we're saying how smell is associated with memory. And he has a sniff test. Wow. I will tell you that when I eat gluten, I literally feel like brain fog. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Like I, I cannot think. Like if I eat gluten, I just cannot think. So it totally makes sense from someone who's gluten free and sensitive. Like I could see how it's connected to memory. Because I could tell you a jar is my memory. That's for sure. That's for sure. So, very interesting. Well, you guys could teach me a lot. I don't know any, I just know from the safe rates here from the Kabbalistic perspective. I don't know 
anything really from the astrological perspective, but it is, I mean, it's all so connected. I mean, you see like the end from the, an energetic perspective, um, but that's interesting because I was thinking that it's a very earthy month, but water is like, but again, it's the idea of like, of we have to see below the surface level during Cheshvan, which is the idea of water, right? The water in, in Kabbalah is called the Olam de Skasia, the hidden worlds. So again, we look at Cheshvan from a very superficial level, from very, in a very superficial way, it could seem like one thing. But again, we have to go really beneath the surface to understand this month, which is the idea really of water, of like really going below the surface to the, the hidden world in order to really understand it. And we said like the idea of that, um, and that's that connection to the temple that when um, Mashiach comes, we're gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna be like fish swimming in that sea. So it definitely all makes sense. Like it all definitely comes together. But um, it was great having everyone on. Everyone should have a beautiful, beautiful month and everyone should, oh wait, first of all, before I forget, okay, speaking of bringing down practical goals, um, first of all, I, I said like two months ago, I was starting a Facebook group and I actually really started it now, okay? So like, I was like, today, I'm like, I'm going on here and I'm teaching you about how we have to bring down goals and I'm like, I am such a talker because I had this thought about doing something a while back. Now is the time I better really do it. So I actually, I really did, um, I did arrange it today. I did actually like organize it today. I'm gonna set, it's called Rise Into Your Feminine. Hey, Rich, hey, Rachel, hey, Rochelle. Um, it's called Rise Into Your Feminine with Miriam. And what I'm gonna do in this group, this has been a dream of mine for a while, is that I wanna really bring down feminine concepts and the idea of, which is the idea of malchut, right? Which is the idea of women, we are redemption. We are this idea of the redemption. But it's really about bringing it down into malchut, bringing it down in a very real way. So I wanna share different ideas about femininity and really how it's brought down. Um, and that's in this Facebook group. And we're also having, for anyone who's interested, an amazing semester. It's called Journey into the Soul in Live Kabbalah. We're doing a great semester, really going into the soul and our soul makeup and um, really how to transcend all these limiting beliefs that we have about ourselves and uh, all these like self-made really obstacles that are part of just our very human self. But we're going to really learn techniques and tools of how to transcend it. And we're going to really learn about our, the essence of our soul. And it's really going to be an amazing, I'm very excited about it personally. It's going to be really amazing. It's starting next week for who, who, anyone who's interested. Um, um, so that'll be, yeah, you can, we'll probably send out emails on that. But again, I want to wish you everyone an amazing, amazing month. And again, we should all reveal this, our own personal redemption and bring the global redemption. And thank you so much for joining. You all taught me a lot. I'm really was I'm very grateful and I'm very happy to be corrected. <laughs> And I'm um, looking forward to sharing more on the group and God willing, next month. We should all join together in Jerusalem next month. That's what we're really waiting for. So, I mean, all right, everyone, have a great day, great night, great day, wherever you are in the world. Okay, bye bye. Bye.